instances of AWS, I need to remind you about two terms, authentication and authorization. They are used in conjunction and often they are used interchangeably. However, in order to understand identity federation, you need to understand the distinction between those two very clearly. Authentication verifies that you are who you claim to be. Think about your email account. To verify that you are the actual owner of given account, you should provide password, some secret information that only you know. Another example is your credit card. You need to input your PIN code before you are able to withdraw money from ATM. When you make a call to a bank call center in order to troubleshoot your car credit card, you are being asked for your mother's maiden name. This is also to verify that you are the owner of the card. You can easily remember this term by making a connection to word authentic. Here is the dictionary definition of it. Authentication always comes as a first step. Authorization always comes after authentication. Authorization decides if you have a permission to access a resource or perform certain action on given resource. Remember analogy of ATM and recall that you are limited to withdraw amount only permitted by your credit card limit. Another analogy might be a sign stating authorized personnel only. Unless you are one of the authorized personnel, you are not welcome there. You can remember this term by making mental connection toward authority. Here is the dictionary definition of it. When we discuss federation, we mean that authentication is happening in one system and that identity is being used in another system. You might ask, why do we need such complexity? Can't we just authenticate users in all systems? Well, if you are the service provider, you want to avoid that. There are two main reasons. Maintaining a secure authentication system and password database is expensive. And forcing your users to commit yet another password to their memory is not user-friendly. Identity Federation stands to solve this problem. We have two systems. The one that provides services, it's called service provider, and one that provides authentication, identity provider. We set up trust relationships between them. This means that service provider will delegate authentication of its users to identity provider. Authenticated users can now access service provider resources. In certification exam, you are presented with scenarios where AWS always is a service provider. In all diagrams in this course, I put identity provider on the left side and service provider on the right. In AWS, both authentication and authorization are implemented by Identity and Access Management Service, IAM, and Secure Token Service, STS. I assume that you are familiar with those services. I still encourage you to read documentation and FAQs on IAM before taking certification exam. In this course, we will focus on Secure Token Service as it is the backbone of Identity Federation. Now let's have a bird's eye view of scenarios we'll be discussing today in detail. First scenario focuses on existing on-premise identity store that we need to authenticate against. Client app has to get access to AWS resources afterwards. Next scenario focuses on mobile application that has to get access to AWS resources. Third scenario involves Active Directory and console access to AWS. And last but not least is about cross-account access between two trusted accounts. I'm not covering two important topics here. One is Amazon Cognito, second is AWS managed Active Directory trust relationships with on-premises domain. You have to go elsewhere to learn those topics. Now let's jump to the first scenario. 
this question scenario describes internal application targeted at a corporate users. Application should authenticate its users against local identity store. It might be LDAP, Active Directory, or anything else. Authenticated users should get limited access to AWS resource. It might be private users directory in S3 bucket. It might be stated that there is secure connection between on-premise data center and AWS cloud. It might also be stated that client application itself is hosted on AWS cloud. In another variation of this question, there might be stated that there is a security team dedicated specifically for questions of user authentication and user permissions. And no one else in your organization should touch this area. Specific question is being asked. How do you implement such a system? This scenario is focusing on still valid but mostly a legacy mechanism for doing identity federation in AWS. It involves additional entity on your side called federation broker. When I hear word broker, I have association of stressed men wearing business suits working on Wall Street. In general terms, broker is someone who acts as a middleman between two entities. If you don't want to take care about all the details of the transaction, you hire a broker and he does all the dirty job and you communicate only with him. In our case, Federation Broker is a gateway or a proxy that all authentication requests go through. You should build and maintain Federation Broker on your environment. Approaches for authenticating users internally are not regulated. You can do it against LDAP, Active Directory, or by any other means that you have. Federation Broker should be used in its own internal logic to match internal users' identity with a set of permissions in AWS. Federation Broker is equipped with long-term AWS security credentials, access key and secret access key and has IAM superpowers. It means that it has the union set of all permissions that would ever be needed by any of the users that are get getting service by the Federation proxy. After authenticating internally, Federation broker will submit a request to one of the following STS actions. Assume role or get federated token. Request to STS is signed with long-term AWS security credentials user, used by Federation Broker. The request can include optional policy or scope policy. It is the JSON format. It's used to further restrict access permissions that are associated with temporary security credentials. Both of these actions return set of temporary security credentials. It means access key ID and secret access key. It also includes session token and expiration time. Please note, returned credentials are not the same ones that are being used by Federation Broker. These temporary security credentials are returned to application and they are used to make API calls to AWS resources. In this scenario, sequencing of events is crucial and in certification exam questions, there will be answers that will get all the right steps included, but se sequencing of the steps will be incorrect. Obviously, this will be the incorrect answer to choose. Let's go through event sequence once again to make it 100% clear what happens when. First, application calls a federation broker for authentication. Note, client app is not calling no other component for authentication. Then, federation broker authenticates the user against the local identity store. Then, federation broker should decide what exact permissions should be granted to given user in AWS. Federation broker should use internal logic to make this decision. 
afterwards call to secure token service to either assume role assume role action or to get federated user credentials get federated token is made one of the parameters for this call is called policy it defines reduced set of permissions to be associated with that particular set of credentials call to sts is signed with long-term credentials used by federation broker Temporary access credentials are returned to the Federation Broker and Federation Broker returns credentials to the client application. The client application uses temporary access credentials to access AWS resources. Please note that to get AWS credentials, client app is communicating only with Federation Broker. The client app is not doing any direct calls to LDAP or to the secure token service on its own. The same approach applies to the scenario where a separate security team is in charge of authentication and permissions. We delegate control over Federation Broker logic and its permissions to a security team and use the Federation Broker as a proxy. In this scenario, both authentication and authorization are happening on a client side. AWS is only creating access credentials. That is all you need to know to solve this scenario. Next, we'll discuss question scenario that involves mobile app. This scenario describes mobile or web application that needs to get access to some AWS resources. It might be S3 bucket or DynamoDB. It is stated that applications are public. Anyone can get access to them. It is stated that number of users is significant. It might be thousands or millions. You have been asked a specific question. How do you implement secure communication between your app and your AWS backend? As in previous case, this scenario focuses on a valid but also outdated approach for identifying users with Web Identity Federation. Now it is recommended to use Amazon Cognito for any new apps that are being developed. If there is no mentioning of Cognito in exam answers, consider the approach discussed here. Recall last time you signed in to some new service online. You have options to sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. Service is delegating authentication part to third party, but does authorization on its own. This is exactly what is being asked in this type of question. When you see login screen like that, most certainly there is OAuth framework and OpenID Connect protocol involved. OpenID Connect is interoperable authentication protocol. It is JSON based and is supported by multiple internet companies. Most widely used identity providers support OpenID Connect. And these include login with Amazon, Facebook or Google. Web Identity Federation in AWS relies on OpenID Connect standard. There are some preparation steps required to make it work in AWS. You should configure your mobile app in third-party identity provider, like Facebook or Google, and receive a unique app ID. You should also create OpenID Connect provider in AWS Management Console, and you should create an IIM role for every identity provider you are going to use. This role should have sufficient permissions inside your AWS account and potentially you should create different AWS roles for different user roles in web application. When these steps are successfully completed, functionality to execute login with third-party identity provider should be implemented in mobile app. Details of this process differ for every identity provider, but generally speaking, user is being authenticated and 
ID token is returned as a result. Typically, ID token is a base 64 encoded and it is in JVT format and it is signed by identity provider. So you always know ID token was issued by that identity provider. ID token contains set of claims, think key value pairs, that identify our user. I have a sample for you on the screen. On the next step, AWS does authorization. Remember that we created a role for every identity provider. This role will be assumed by mobile app users. And mobile app user will be granted same permissions that role has. In order to do this, the mobile app makes a call to STS action called assume role with web identity. In the request, mobile app passes the ID token it received from third party identity provider and specifies Amazon resource name, ARM, of IAM role to be assumed. Please note that this call is not signed. Mobile app does not have any IAM credentials available at the moment. STS verifies ID token against identity provider and returns back AWS temporary security credentials. In diagram, I intentionally haven't included this token verification step. But be aware, STS is checking token you have provided with third-party provider behind the scenes. By default, temporary security credentials are valid for one hour. Mobile app should cache temporary credentials and issue another assume role with web identity action call whenever temp credentials are not longer valid. Now mobile app is equipped with these temporary credentials and it can call AWS services via the API. As in previous example, understanding event sequence is very important. So I'll repeat it once again. First, mobile app authenticates against third-party identity provider receiving ID token. Then mobile app calls secure token service and gets temporary AWS credentials. Call is being made to STS action called assume role with web identity. This call is not signed. And with that credentials, mobile app can make API calls to AWS resources. This is it for this scenario. Please remember that in this scenario, you should not create an IAM user per each new user of the mobile app. Instead, you should create one role per one identity provider. You should not generate access credential in AWS Management Console and store them in mobile app permanently. You should not create Active Directory and authenticate using SAML. You should not validate AWS credentials against third-party identity provider like Facebook, Google or Amazon. Next, we'll review scenario for accessing AWS Management Console. This question scenario describes organization that has migrated or is extending its infrastructure in AWS Cloud. A lot of people from this organization needs to get access to AWS Management Console creation of new user directory in IAM is not an option. Maybe because there is one user directory already available internally, it might be mentioned Active Directory, or because users are not willing to commit yet another password to their memory. Question being asked, how do you implement such a system? AWS provides a possibility for federating your internal users with existing identity system. The mechanism for this federation relies on SAML 2.0. SAML stands for Security Assertion Mark Markup Language. It is an open standard that many identity providers use. 
It was introduced in early 2000s and it is XML based. It's well adapted by industry and it is supported by Active Directive Federation services and by Shibboleth. Before we jump into details, let's refresh a few terms. Identity Provider is a system that manages users' identity information and provides user authentication. In exam questions, it will most probably be Active Directory or Active Directory of Federation services. Service Provider, it is the system that provides service to the user. In this scenario, AWS acts as a service provider. SAML assertion is a piece of data produced by identity provider that confirms authorization of a user. It also includes a set of user attributes, for example, user roles or groups user belongs to. You are probably curious about how SAML assertion looks like. So here it is. Remember, it is from early 2000s and it's all XML. This SAML assertion is generated by identity provider and browser will post it to AWS. As you might notice, it's quite verbose. I highlighted attribute where email is present. In the end of this document, there are role names user belongs to. Please note that in order to make SAML assertion work with AWS, you need to do a few configuration steps. You must configure SAML identity provider to include set of claims required by AWS into SAML. Claims is essentially specific attributes in SAML assertion and AWS expects some specific ones to be present in it. Additionally, you must use AWS Identity and Access Management to create a SAML provider entity in your AWS account that represents your identity provider. You must also create an IAM role that specifies this SAML provider in its trust policy. AWS provides two ways for you to use SAML Federation. Both of them rely on STS method called assume role with SAML. This action does not require signing. In other words, you don't need any AWS credential to is issue this action request. First approach is to use SAML-based federation to get API access. As in previous scenarios, it will result in getting temporary credentials. Second way is to implement web-based si single sign-on to AWS Management Console. And this is what exam question will focus on. First, I will quickly describe the first approach. This diagram can be found in AWS documentation. Let's quickly walk through it. A user in your organization is using client app to request authorization. The app is authenticating against identity provider. Identity provider reaches to LDAP identity store. Identity provider returns back SAML assertion. Client app calls STS action called assume role with SAML, providing SAML assertion from identity provider as a parameter. Client also specifies Amazon resource name of IAM role to be assumed. STS responds with temporary security credentials. Client now uses the temporary security credentials to call API operations. The most important thing to remember here is the sequencing of the events. Remember that you should always authenticate against identity provider first and only then call STS. Please note that this method doesn't provide access to the management console. Instead, it provides temporary credentials to execute API operation on AWS resources. Now, let's say a few words about single sign-on and what it actually means. Recall last time when you used Google Docs. If you have previously logged into Gmail from the same browser window, Google Docs opens without any additional credentials from your side. 
you take this for granted. Uh, Google Docs and Gmail are both products of the same company. Now imagine yourself signing in to your company's internal web app and getting access to a third-party web app without the need to provide your credentials. This is actually a single sign-on. In this question scenario, users can sign in to a portal in your organization, and this portal is hosted by identity provider compatible with SAML. Afterwards, while being in the same browser window, they select an option to go to AWS Management Console and they are magically redirected to the console without having to provide additional signing information. Now let's look into details how this is done. Please note this diagram differs very little from previous one. Steps are following. A user navigates to the browser-based application that is hosted by identity provider. Think Active Directory Federation Services. Identity provider verifies the user identity in the organization. Identity provider generates SAML assertion. Client browser is redirected to AWS single sign-on endpoint and posts SAML assertion. Single sign-on endpoint is requests temporary security credential from STS on behalf of the user and creates console sign-in URL for that specific user. Single sign-on endpoint sends redirect response to the browser and the browser redirected to AWS Management Console and signed in automatically. This is much more user-friendly scenario as everything happens behind the scenes and user is only required to authenticate once. Everything else happens automatically. Sequencing of the events is mostly the same and as in a previous case. As you already have guessed, this is the solution you are being asked about in the exam question. Key terms to seek for in an answer. SAML 2.0 compiled identity provider, single sign-on endpoint. Please note that in this scenario you should not be using Web Identity Federation, using tokens from OpenID Connect, OAuth, and trying to authenticate with them against IAM. Or you should not be using Kerberos. Potentially, you might encounter similarly from formulated question with two options mentioning SAML assertions. Recall that assume role with SAML returns temp security credentials for API access, not for logging into AWS Management Console. This is all you need to know and, as usual, remember the sequence of events. Next, we'll review the cross-account access scenario. Questions in this scenario may vary but underlying situation is as follows. You need to grant access to your AWS resources to third party. It might be individual or system that requires that access. It is clearly stated that third party has an AWS account of its own. Requirements for access might vary, but it might be read-only access for auditing needs or permissions to execute API calls against your AWS resources. Question being asked, how do you securely solve this problem? Let's clarify some terms here. AWS account that is granting access to its resources, it's called trusting account. AWS account that receives access permissions is called trusted account. This approach requires creation of an additional role in trusting account. This role should have minimum permissions required to execute necessary actions. Also, it should state exact AWS account ID of trusted account that will be assumed in this role. After this role is created, you need to get its IRN 
and provide it to a trusted account. Trusted account should update user permissions on its side to allow assume role action call. IRN of the newly created role should also be specified. Once these preparation steps are completed, trusted side can make a call to STS action called assume role, passing IRN of role from trusting account. This call should be signed with long-term credentials the trusted party has. In a result, temporary access credentials are returned and they can be used to access trusting account resources using API. In this scenario, you should not create new user and grant access credentials to the third party. Hand your root access credentials to third party. As usual, it's important to remember the sequence of events before you go into certification exam. This is all you need to know about this question scenario.